Today, I am talking about yeast infections. What is it? What causes it? How can we treat it? What works and what doesn't? So stay tuned. Hey everyone, welcome back. Dr. Jennifer Lincoln, board certified OBGYN here. And today I am talking to you about all things yeast. If you're watching this YouTube, there's a pretty good chance you've been searching what causes a yeast infection or what can I do to treat a yeast infection? And there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I'm going to give you the answers. I'm not gonna take up a whole lot of your time doing it. And if you need any more references or resources, go ahead and check out my show notes because I've got lots of good stuff there for you. And before we get started, if you're not already subscribed, you should totally do that and turn on the bell too for notifications so you don't miss any of my content. Okay, that's out of the way. Let's get started and jump right in. What is a yeast infection? So a fancy word for a yeast infection is called candidiasis. And what that is is when yeast, which is present in the vagina and is not abnormal, but when yeast gets a little too crazy and sort of overgrows and unbalances what's in the vagina. There are lots of different kinds of yeast out there. And the most common one that we see for yeast infections is candida albicans. But as I'll get to later, that's not the only one that can mess things up. And if you've gotten a yeast infection, I promise you, you're not alone because up to 50% of vagina owners at some point in time will have a yeast infection. And that's why talking about this is important. So what are common symptoms of a yeast infection? I think we've all heard of that cottage cheese discharge, which is very common when you've got a yeast infection. Although I'll get to it in a little bit about how self-diagnosis isn't always great, but this can be a very common presenting symptom. Itching is another big one. So just feeling like you can't stop itching down there. You can also see with more severe infections, you can see swelling or redness of the vulva. And sometimes it's so bad that you can actually get little cuts or fissures. So not fun for anyone. Let's talk next diagnosis. So you might see that cottage cheese discharge when you wipe and go, yep, yeast infection, time to go to the pharmacy and get some over-the-counter medication. But I don't want you to do that. And here's why. We are really bad at self-diagnosis. And I'm not just saying that I've seen patients who come in and they think they have a yeast infection and they don't. And they're not smart, not at all. Like actual studies have shown that when people come in presenting with what we call vaginitis symptoms, that what they often have self-diagnosed as is not actually what they've got going on. And this includes people who know what's going on down there. So self-diagnosis isn't great. So the ideal situation would be that you would come in and get an exam. That's the best way that we can diagnose a yeast infection. And I promise you, I'm not asking you to come into the office because I want to make money. In the long run, if you self-diagnose what you think is a yeast infection, buy some treatments, they don't work. Now you've treated with a bunch of different things. In the process, the infection's gotten worse. When you come in, it's something else, and now you need a more expensive treatment. You've actually wasted a lot of time and potentially more money and all of that other stuff. So it's not about us making money. Three main ways that we can diagnose a yeast infection. One is when you come in and we do an exam and we take a little swab and we look under the microscope. And as you can see here, this is a picture of yeast spores and hyphae. So when we see that under the microscope, we go, aha, yeast, we can treat that. The second way is something called a yeast culture. Now this is something where again, we take a swab, we send it to the lab and they see what grows out. As you can imagine, this isn't immediate. This can take a day or two in order to get results. But cultures are very important, especially for certain types of infections, and I'll get back to that. The third thing that we can do is a DNA PCR test. Again, we take a swab, send it down to the lab, and they can do a PCR test, usually in a few hours, to figure out if yeast is there or not. It's not as good. Really, the best thing is looking under the microscope, but if that's all your office has and they don't have a microscope, that can be a good backup test. The bottom line, Self-diagnosis isn't great and coming in and getting a real diagnosis so we know what we're fighting and using the right tools is really important. Okay, let's just jump to treatment because maybe you're here and you're like itching and you've got the discharge and you know you have a yeast infection and you wanna know, what do I do about it? So it depends if it's a complicated or an uncomplicated infection. Yes, even yeast can get complicated. So an uncomplicated infection is really just what it sounds like. It's your regular run of the mill yeast infection. It's not too severe. And we can give you medicine either that goes in the vagina or a pill that you take by mouth. And that can cure up to 90% of yeast infections. You may notice that on the shelves, there are lots of different formulations of medicines, right? There's the, there's the suppositories, there's the creams, there's the little capsules, lots of different formulations. And you can work with your healthcare provider to figure out which one might be best for you. 
Some people prefer a one day regimen. Others might need a three or a seven day regimen, especially if you're pregnant. So it just depends. Okay, let's talk about when it gets complicated. So there's three times that we would consider a yeast infection to be complicated and therefore require different treatment. The first one is when you have a really severe infection. So remember when I talked back about like really bad swelling, you know, maybe fissures, like erosions, just terrible situation on the vulva, that would be a complicated severe infection. And that may require multiple doses a few days apart or maybe for two weeks. And so that's really important to work with your healthcare provider on that one. The second time is when you have a recurrent infection. And these are diagnostically proven recurrent infections, meaning that it, this is why it's so important for us to see you. So in these situations, we may recommend an initial dose where we kind of knock it down and then additional doses to suppress or to keep it from coming back. And sometimes we do this for like up to six months. The third kind of complicated infection is when it's caused by a yeast strain that is not that albicans, that candida albicans yeast that I told you about earlier. That's the responsible one for most yeast infections. And this can happen in about 10% of yeast cases. And so how might you know that you have one of these more complicated non-albicans yeast infections? Well, you do the typical treatment and you don't get any better. And that's when you might do a culture. And that's when your doctor can say, hey, that's what we've got going on here. So treatment for this can include the typical medications as well as boric acid. And if you wanna know more about boric acid, and I bet you do, because a lot of people have watched this video already, go ahead and check this one up here in the card where I talk about boric acid, when it should be used, when it shouldn't be used, how it works, and why it's not just something you should be buying over the counter without working with your healthcare provider. So in this situation with a non-albicans yeast, using boric acid for a couple of weeks with or without some other medications and close monitoring can actually be the way that you finally beat this yeast. Here are some alternative therapies that I've seen out there advertised as being cures for yeast. Eating garlic, putting garlic in your vagina, tea tree oil in the vagina, douching with a plethora of things, avoiding sugar, there's a whole candida diet that claims that it will treat yeast, and probiotics. None of these are recommended to treat yeast, even though I know that there are so many people out there, especially in the holistic space, who are pushing these. But the bottom line is, is that the data is not there yet. It doesn't mean it might not change, but as of right now, I'm not going to tell you to try something that has not been well studied and could cause harm, or has been studied and has been shown to do absolutely nothing. Here are some things that do help though with yeast infections. So breathable cotton underwear can really help because when you have something like silk or satin, it can really trap the moisture and can lead to that imbalance that lets candida and other yeast and other bacteria overgrow. Getting out of sweaty or wet clothing and reevaluating all the products that you're putting down there. So feminine washes, douches, all of that stuff is so damaging and so harmful to the pH balance of your vulva and your vagina. And so you should be avoiding them. I hope that was helpful in explaining what yeast infections are, how we figure them out, how we treat them, what works, what doesn't, and why we really wanna partner with you when it comes to treating these. If you've got questions or comments, go ahead and drop them in my comment section below and follow me on Instagram and TikTok for more and subscribe and do all the stuff here. And I hope that this was helpful. All right, everybody, stay safe. And until next time, bye-bye.